don't talk on the phone. You understand? You do understand. You do understand that if you talk on the phone, we're going to get caught. You are a gang member. So they automatically, look, I know I ain't got to say it. I'm going to say it. They automatically listen to all your phone calls. There is a big ass sign. Look, see that? Right above the phones. It says these calls can and will be monitored. Kind of like can and will be used against you in the court of law. All right, man, you're always on the phone. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you what not to do. Do not get on that phone and talk about this to people. You holler one of your homeboys, use their cell phone, then delete the number, write it in a letter. Do not get on there thinking you're slicker than the guards listening. They are going to overhear the code words, the little things, snowball, hardball, all these things. They know to listen for them. We're going to jail. All right? I got your word. First time I'm bringing you on, right? All right. Why are the guards coming over here? Come on, man. I know you didn't get up. Officers have recordings of everything he said. Hours worth of conversations. Hey, stupid. Yeah, I, yeah, we're going to jail. We're already in prison. No shit. But we're going to jail. Jail, jail. Like we're going back to street court. We're leaving prison and we're going to the jail because we have new charges. Make sure you get on the phone and call your girl when you get there. Oh, you can't. Because she's in jail. You got to be the stupidest motherfucker. Man, you already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life. And we're back. Do's and don'ts. More or less, don'ts. Prison phones, jail phones. They're there. They're there for a reason. They're there so you can reach out and talk to your mom. So you can call your kids. So you can get in touch with your lawyer. So you can reach out to family and friends. That's why the phones are on the wall. So that you can call the people that you know. The people that care about you. Might need some commissary. Might need some money. Might owe a debt. Hey, I need you to send some money. That's very normal. Right above that phone. Every place I've ever been. There is a sign. That informs you. That they are listening. Yeah I know it kind of sounds weird that they're listening. But they're listening. They're always listening especially if you're known if you're known for trouble you've got a drug history and you're going to be red flagged and you're going to be listened to but regardless they're going to listen to your phone calls they have guys that are hired they have full-time jobs listening to your phone calls that is how they make a living listening to your phone calls and when nobody's using a phone guess what they're doing they're going over phone calls that were made earlier that day. You do not by any means ever think that you are smarter than the people that have been doing this as long as you've been alive. 19, 20, 30 years old. And you think you're going to get on here and you're going to trick a system that has been in place as long as you've been alive. Some of these guys were doing this the day you popped out the woman into a pamper. They were listening to them phone calls. They've been to many court cases. They've watched many men go into handcuffs and leave in the back of a patrol car. They've watched the state police pull up and charge people. They've dealt with everything from drugs to, to murder confessions. You name it when it comes to those phones. But here comes your dumb ass. You're going to get on the phone to talk about something you ain't supposed to talk about and think that it ain't going to end bad. You are locked up for committing crimes. Take that as a lesson. You're not a good criminal. You are incarcerated. You got caught. The cops only have to get lucky once. You have to get lucky every time. If you find yourself locked up, you may want to choose a new profession. And you definitely don't want to continue trying to be a criminal while incarcerated. Those phones will send you to jail every single time. Remember back in the day, everybody was throwing the chirps away when we heard the feds were listening. We, was throwing, we had the next tail chirp. 
and then we found out the feds had a contract with him. You could walk through the streets of Philly and the gutters were lined with him. Dudes would take the thing. As soon as everybody heard it, they were snapping them and tossing them and tossing them. Trash cans were filled with them. Like, they were everywhere. But you'll go to prison or jail and get on a phone that you know belongs to the police and try to talk in code. Man, it's too much. Let's just get into it. You know how to see it. You know how to live it. So, let's relive. I'll be the first to admit uh, I engaged in things I shouldn't have engaged in while locked up. I've talked about it. I sold drugs. I sold weapons. I sold most items that could spin a monetary game. I had reasons, I guess you could say I did it. But the biggest reason I did it was because I was a criminal. Regardless of me saying that this was to help take care of my son that I left behind, or it was for this, or it was for that, or it was to start a new life when I came home. I've come to realize that the majority of the illegal things I did while I locked up was because I was still a criminal. Me and my son got to talking last night. Shout out to my son Isaiah, he's 19 years old. My son was two when I left, almost 13 when I returned. Every single year, not a year except for the year that I was in the hole, every single year that I was gone, I was away in prison, I would send money home. School supplies, I'll take care of it. School clothes, I'll take care of it. Christmas time, here's Christmas money. He needs a new winter jacket this year, here's money for clothes. Like clockwork, throughout the year, I would send money home. And in talking to him about that last night, he kind of came up to, how are you doing that? How are you able to take care of me from prison? And I pretty much told him, I said, I was you know, doing things I, I shouldn't be doing while I was locked up to make money. You know, I was selling this, I was selling that. I'd have the money sent to my books and I'd let it stack. And when you needed it, I'd send it home so I could, I guess, I don't know, maybe still feel like some part of being a dad. So I was doing all these different things. And all my years of what I did, I never got on that phone. I got on the phone to talk to people all the time. I was known for being on the phone. There were phases I would go where I just would go through depressions and I wanted to be left alone. I wanted to pretend that everything outside of prison didn't exist. And I just wanted to live my life behind the wall. You know what I mean? Just myself. I found it easier at times not to know what was going on in the outside world. It just made my bed smoother. But then there were times where I would reconnect with somebody or I'd start talking to somebody I hadn't talked to in a long time and the conversations would pick up. I'd be on that phone all the time. Never did I get on there and speak of anything illegal, anything that I had done illegal in the past, anything that was going on inside the prison. I'd even have people ask me questions because they don't realize that we're being recorded. And they'd be like, so about that money you sent, man, uh, where are you getting this money from? I'd be like, come on, man. Uh, so uh, how's the kids doing? I'd switch subjects. Because as they're talking, I'm like, I'm looking at the sign right above my head. I know they're listening. Dudes would be on the phone with their girls, getting freaky. Got the jacket over top of them with a blanket over them, and they're over there talking. sexy time on the phone, right? And they know. I've done it. A girl would be like, isn't there somebody listening to us right now? And I'd be like, yeah, but they're weird. Who gives a shit? Let them listen. They're listening. There was a dude in my last, the last place I was at was a dorm setting. And I did not like the dude. Nobody liked the dude. He was a, more or less a bully. But he knew who he could bully. Like he didn't bully the bullies. He bullied like smaller dudes. I never had no interactions with him. Just didn't like him because I how I'd seen him get down. Me and him never spoke, never had no words. We never argued over the phone. He had his phone. I had the phone I used every day. And, if, you know, he let somebody use his phone, whatever. He used to have this girl that he would talk to. And this guy is literally months from going home. I'm talking less than 90 days. Before you go home, you have to go do blood work, DNA. They test you for STDs and other illnesses and diseases because they want to make sure you're, you know, fresh when you go home and you ain't going home and nothing you don't know about. He had done all that. DMV comes into the prison within six months of you going home and they do your photograph so that when you leave, you've got an ID card. So when you see guys go over there and get their IDs, you know, all right, they're within six months of going home. Then when they call them for blood work, you know, okay, they're 90 days from going home. 
this dude had this chick. I guess it was his baby mama, I'm going to assume, because she used to come see him with a little boy, that he would get on the phone with, and he would disrespect this girl past what disrespect was. I'm talking about just calling her the nastiest names, talking about her body and how he don't need her. And he would scream. And this is a dorm now at the top of his lungs. He's on the phone. You stanky body. Like just going in on her. You funny shape. Blah, blah. Like just disrespecting this woman, right? A couple hours later, he'd be on the phone. What's up, girl? Just talking to her like nothing had happened. She'd be in the visiting room. Every single week, she would come up there. Then after she would leave, he'd be out in the yard. He'd have his drugs. He'd have his weed, all these different things that this girl was bringing him. I think he was at this point maybe about two weeks from getting out and he gets on the phone with her and she had took some of her tax money and set it aside for him. And bless him with $3,500 when he gets out. Dude's a whole entire piece of shit, to be honest. Like, he's just garbage. The girl's going to give him this money to start his life with. He gets on the phone one day and tells her, you can stick that $3,500 up your... Don't nobody give a about that. And he goes into threatening the girl. We're all listening. Talking about when I come home, I'll beat the shit up. I'll, you know, break your face. I'll beat your brother up. I'll beat your daddy up. I'll beat everybody, your family up. I'll smash y'all. Like, y'all got me messed up. Like, y'all think because I'm locked up, I can't come home and be that dude. Wait till I get up out of here. I'm putting hands on everybody here. Yeah, I'm shutting shit down. Y'all forgot about me because I'm locked up. Wait till I get out. She had had enough of his mouth. He had been doing this for months and months and months and months. Dude was real bipolar. I seen him at the phone one day, and he's just dialing, dialing. She's not answering. Tells his homeboy, hey, have your people do a three-way call, see if she picks up. She picks up. When she realizes this three-way call is for this dude that's locked up, that's threatened her and her family, she hangs up the phone. He is within days of going home, and I see the investigators coming to the pod. He hasn't got no visits from this girl now couple weeks now he's just been sitting there looking stupid in the face dialing that number over and over and over on that phone the threat this girl on that phone was all that's been recorded the investigators come in and they get him they take him out a short time later the officers come in they put on their black gloves they go over to his bunk and they start taking everything out of his locker and putting it in a bag pull the drawer some money the bunk take his clothes out and they put it in the bag just like that that phone will just open back up. We got an open bunk in here. Dude's not coming back. He's got some homeboys I told you he kicked it with. On his day of release, they call. The number he gave them, trying to find out where he is, how things are going for him. And they tell him, nah, he didn't get out. Nope. The day he was supposed to get out, the police were waiting at the prison, rearrested him for making threats over the phone. The girl also went on to tell the police everything that had happened. Got her immunity. They swore to her you'll get no charges. And she gave them all the contact information on the people he was dealing with when it came to drugs. She told them the numbers that were calling him, that she was being called from, from the cell phones, what drugs she was bringing in, how long she had been bringing them in, and what she had been bringing them in. And he was recharged for all that. The proof was all right there. Plus, they had a, vic uh, they had a witness, her. The girl he threatened. She told everything. So on top of the terroristic threats, the threats to do bodily harm, several counts because he named several people in the phone conversation, he would be charged with all these conspiracy charges, distribution charges, delivery charges, and sent back to prison. All because huh, he wanted to get on that phone. He wanted to be the tough guy. Disrespect somebody that's looking out for you. Somebody that cares for your dumb ass. You want to get on the phone because she ain't doing it when you say do it or the way you say do it. You think you're okay? He was slick in the fact that he would use cell phones to plan everything. He was slick in the fact that he would call his people on the outside and have them set it up through her. But at the end of the day, he made enemies with the one person that had the most power in his life. The person that had more power over him than he had. And he made enemies with that person via the penitentiary phone. At another point in my beard, I found myself in the hole. I found myself in what we call the jail. When you're in prison and they say they, they took him to jail, that usually means you went to hole. 
Um, when they say he caught new charges, they usually say he's going to street court. But I found myself in the hole, and it was for weapons charges. Actually, I was under investigation for weapons charges. They were finding weapons that were being used amongst the inmates. And with the maintenance job I had, the only way these particular items could make it into population and into the hands of inmates were through the few select maintenance workers they had. Things like lightning rods on top of buildings. The only people that can get on top of the buildings are us, the maintenance workers. These things were easy to get off. You would come off the building, go down the staircase, and usually you would just return to your pod. You didn't have to go through any metal detectors. So you could have five of these lightning rods shoved down the side of your pants that are about this long that are already sharpened to a point because it's a lightning rod. We all go to work one day. We're sitting in the maintenance shop, getting ready to start our day. And I've been doing this for a while now. It was a means of me surviving. It was a means of me also having weapons to defend myself. I would usually, I'm not going to say put the weapons in hands of guys that I, I pretty much knew they were all going to get used at some point or another. But the guys that I gave them to, I wouldn't just sell to anybody. I wouldn't sell to somebody that was potentially going to become my enemy or somebody that I didn't know because I didn't want to get stabbed with these things. So we're sitting in the maintenance shop and all of us guys are just, you know, starting our day. It's early in the morning, about 7.30, then drank some coffee, waiting to figure out what we got to go fix in the prison for the day, getting tools and stuff together. Captains, lieutenants, all of them come in and tell them, all y'all step up. We stand up. They search us. They don't find anything. Put handcuffs on all of them, take them to the hole. I wasn't the only one selling things. I wasn't the only one making weapons. There were other guys in there as well. So it wasn't like I got everybody jammed up. There was a couple guys that had nothing to do with it. They got jammed up. But they take us and they throw us all in the hole. Boom, we're off. Well, prior to this, the reason for all this happening was there was a big gang fight on the yard. I want to say maybe a week prior to this whole thing unwinding. And the weapons they recovered were items that had come out the maintenance shop. So to the hole I go. When I first get back in the hole, I'm like, hey, where's the phone at? I'm yelling down to say, where's the phone? I need to use the phone. Y'all get the phone once a month. Y'all just got the phone the other day. You won't see it for 30 days. Damn. Well, a couple of the dudes that were involved in the whole stabbing thing on the yard, and it was a whole lot of people that were fighting more or less, this small group of people. It was like a lot of dudes attacking three or four dudes, and they all had knives. These dudes did their best to defend themselves, but it was just so many people they couldn't. They couldn't. They had no chance. I'm on the tier with a bunch of these gang members that are under investigation for these stabbings. The officers don't know exactly which, one of, which ones of them are responsible for the stabbings, but they know that, all right, all those guys were in that group of men when all the stabbings were taking place. They had these dudes cornered. There was nowhere for them to go. So they started pinpointing certain individuals. There were guys that also got jammed up that had nothing to do with it. They were just standing there watching. I told you, I asked them, where's the phone? Why ain't you use the phone? Why ain't you Y'all get the phone once a month. Y'all get the phone once a month. Well, the next day, the phones roll around. I had a dude on the tier say, yo, they looking out with the phones. Man, I'll never bring the phones like this. So they bring the phones through. You get 20 minutes. If you don't get through to nobody on that 20 minutes, you ain't going to see the phone until you see it again. And then they take it and they roll it to the next cell. They open a the little slot. You can reach out, dial the number of phones on wheels. And it's got a long ass cord attached to it. You reach out, you dial it, you pull the phone through the slot, and you sit there and talk. The following day, they bring the phones through again. Every day, they're bringing us these phones. I'm thinking, they changed something. This is this is great. Like, I'm in the hole. I can still make my little phone calls, talk to people here and there. That's what's up. This takes place for a matter of maybe the first two weeks I'm back there. They come in one day, and one by one, they start rounding these gang members up. Some of them are being released and some of them are going to the investigator's office. A bunch of them went back on the yard. A couple of them returned back to the same tier that I was on and would go on to tell us we wouldn't be seeing the phone no more. They got more in depth on why they had been bringing the phone around. Y'all know how they've been bringing the phone around every single day and they usually don't bring it but once a month? Man, they use that shit to jam us up, man. Yeah, y'all was getting the phone because of us. They figured since they couldn't get nobody to talk, all they had to do was give them the phone and they'd tell them themselves. And they did. The one dude got jammed up by saying, I did what I had to do and I handled my business. It ain't my problem. Those simple words. I guess when there's people asking, 
What did you, did you stab, dude? Man, I did what I had to do. You know what I mean? It ain't my problem. It is what it is. I'm good. That would be his conviction. Other dudes getting into more details on why it happened, what took place, breaking down what led to it, other guys' names that were involved in it. A bunch of these guys would go on to get street charges. They did the same thing about where the weapons came from. They just said, this is what happened. This is what was going on. Yeah, I hit old boy up. Oh, he was screaming like a bitch. Man, you should have seen him bleeding everywhere. They're on the phones bragging about what happened during this big-ass gang rumble. They ain't got nobody else to talk to, really. You're in the hole. So they're talking to their people about it. Those guys went on the court, got attempted murder charges, malicious wounding charges, maiming charges, inmates in possession of weapons charges, and their phone stopped coming back around. I was sitting there for a couple months, pending the investigation. My people asked me what I was in the hole for. I said, I don't know. They said something about some weapons. I don't got no clue what's going on. I did what I was supposed to as a convict. Even as a convict, you don't really tell other people, even other convicts, what you got going on. You just keep it quiet. I kept it quiet, did my couple months in the hole, got out, went back in the population, went right back to my job. I chilled with the weapons after that because in being in the hole and seeing the whole thing escalate on the yard, I did still have weapons, but I stopped distributing them because it was kind of, it was, it was, it wasn't a good feeling knowing that something I had given somebody was ultimately used to try to kill somebody else. Watching them dudes run scared, pinned in a corner, and getting poked up and cut and stabbed was a really, really bad feeling. Even though I hadn't done it, I felt partially responsible. I used to tell myself, well, if I ain't make the weapons and give them to them, they still would have got their hands on them. Does that really even matter? But yeah, that's how them dudes would ultimately get jammed up in that situation is the guards were smart enough to know, all right, we got a whole lot of guys locked up. We ain't got nobody talking. Nobody's giving anything up. We got like little inmates in population dropping slips and snitching on what's going on. But if we really want to know what happened that day, let them dudes in the hole use the phone. Because some of them dudes are going to talk about what happened over that phone. And we'll, need, we'll get everything we need to know right from their mouths. It's hard to fight your case when they got you on the jack telling everybody what happened. When they got you on the jack bragging about your crimes. Oh, you a real big gangster. You in prison stabbing people up, huh? Oh, you tried to take him up out of here, left him leaking, hit him up 30 times, huh? Oh, your girl thinks you a real savage. See what the prosecutor thinks you are when you go back in front of him because you decided to get on that phone and disclose information that only you and the guys that were there knew about. I've personally went to the hole, been jammed up, and caught more time behind the prison telephone. Not because I was on the prison telephone talking, but because somebody I let in on something I was doing, I had going on at the time, chose to go against everything we talked about and got on the phone. And I've talked, I've told this story in the past, so we'll get into it for y'all that ain't heard it. I'll skip a lot of the details and we'll just get to the nitty gritty. There was a point in 2007 where I had drugs being brought into the prison. Everything was running smooth. Well, the problem with it is supply and demand. The demand is there. The money is there. You got guys in prison. You think that everybody in prison is broke? Now you got business owners in prison that have drug habits. You got guys in prison that's families are well off that have drug habits and if you're looking to capitalize on something, something that's going to put money in your pocket, drugs is the way to go. So for a better part of, I guess, two years at that point, my clockwork, I had this stuff coming in, crack cocaine. Guys were smoking it up. With the supply and demand, I can't supply as much as they're demanding. I got guys that are willing to, whatever the price is, buy the entire package the moment I get back with it. They don't want me to let nobody else know I got it. No, you can't break it up. Give it to me straight like it is. What do you want for it? The money will be on your books tomorrow. I can't swallow but so much of this shit. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm nervous at the point that I swallow it. I want to hurry up and get out the visitation room and get back to my cell because I'm afraid my stuff's going to bust in my stomach. I'm going to lay on the floor right here in the visitation room and die. Like Usually after I swallow it, my visit ends in about five, ten minutes. Hey, look, I got to go. I got to go. Bleh and get this up out of here. 
I bring my cellmate on, which at the time was a gang member. Thero Duel, from the same area I was from, knew a lot of the same people. I won't say I trusted dude, but I entrusted dude. I'd kind of put faith in him. And just watching the way he moved, he was a little different than all the other gang members. I said, yeah, dude's, dude's hip to the game. He's all right. I mean, I, I can rock with dude. So I, he knows already the process. He knows everything. When I come back from visits, he used to watch the door. I'd take some shampoo and some coffee, put it inside of a peanut butter jar, and I'd add the shampoo, and I'd shake it up. And it'd get foamy, and I'd drink it. Soon, no sooner I'd drink it, I'd throw up. I'd throw up all the balloons right in the sink. He'd watch the door, right? Well, now it's gotten to a point where I need more. So I bring him on board. He reaches out to his girl, tells me, I tell him from the beginning, do not listen to me, man. I've been successful at what I do for so long because I do not get on the phone. I, we've seen guys think they were slick, try to get on there and, hey, look, yeah, man, uh, my homeboy's dropping off some softballs at your house, you know what I mean, so we can play softball. Make sure you, you get those, those softballs. Stupid stuff. They get on the phone and try to talk in code like, who gets on a prison phone and starts talking about softballs being dropped off at the house, right? He agrees. I tell him, if you're going to do anything, give it one of your homeboys. This is 2007. Cell phones were not booming in the prison I was in like that in 2007. But with the gangs, they had a couple here and there floating around. I said, either get up with one of your homeboys, use one of their cell phones to make the call, or write in a letter, because they're not allowed to check your outgoing mail. They weren't supposed to. I said, write it in a letter, but do not get on the phone and explain anything to her. Please do not, man. You're going to get us jammed up. Jay, I got you, man. You think I'm stupid or something? Like, come on, man. I ain't no green bean. I ain't going to get on that phone and talk about nothing I ain't supposed to. What's he do? Hey, Jay's girl is going to call you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't worry about it. Look, yeah. It's my cellmate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, I'm going to give you her number or she's going to call you one of the two. You try to get in touch with her if you don't hear from her. But, yeah, look, yeah, you get in touch with her. She's going to give you something to bring to me. She'll tell you how to do it. She'll tell you how to wrap it up. And, yeah, you're going to ride with her. Gets on the phone and talks about the whole process right over the phone. Word for word. Like, wasn't even good at trying to keep secret on what he was talking about. Anybody that had never even done that job after about three minutes would know what he was talking about. That day of visitation rolls around. He's told me, nah, man, I didn't talk about nothing on the phone. I would never talk about nothing on the phone. Sitting there, I see my son's mother come in, and I see my son with her, which automatically irritated me because I always told her, this shit could go south. Don't ever bring my son with you, ever. Never, ever bring my son with you when you do this. She couldn't get a babysitter this day, so she brings my little boy with her, which at the time, he's about five. I see them. We've been sitting in the visitation room now a very long time. Usually I would come in and my visitors would already be there. They'd be sitting at the table. They'd have snacks. They'd have sodas and stuff waiting on me. My son would run up and hug me or whoever was there would be waiting on me. I'd check with the officer at the front. Then I'd go find my people and sit down. I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm just, I get that feeling. You know when you get that feeling in your stomach like shit is just wrong. Something's bad. It's about to happen. That feeling just consumes me. He's sitting at the table, like adjacent from me, across from me. And I'm like, yo. And he looks back at me and I say, yo, something's wrong. Now nah, everything's good. I'm like, nah, something's wrong, man. Something's wrong. Before you come in the visiting room, there's a door there that half of it's metal, then there's bars at the top, and it's got plexiglass on it. You can see your visitors when they come through. I see my son's mother come through the door, and I can see the top of my son's head. And rather than come through the second door that lets them into the visitation room where I'm at, I see them shoot into the bathroom real quick. A couple seconds later, maybe 15 seconds later, I see a whole ass load of officers come through that first door and they're trying to get that bathroom door open where she's at. She's in there flushing. She's dumping everything, getting it up off of her. Because of his phone call, they knew that his girl was bringing things in that weekend. They also knew that she was riding with my son's mother. They knew that my son's mother had given it to her. Initially, when they get there, they have the canines there, the drug dogs there up front. The dogs hit on the girl. Girl gives them all these, no, nah, I ain't got nothing. I ain't done nothing. Maybe I got gas. We'll go use the bathroom then if you got gas. Don't stand in line and have gas and bust ass. That's rude. Disrespectful to the other people here visiting their people. Go use the bathroom. She goes in the bathroom. Dog didn't hit on my son's mother. Dog didn't alert on my son's mother. Just this girl. Guards following behind her. Hey, 
We know you got it on you. Hey, we got you on the phone conversation. We know what you're bringing in. We know everything. Give it to us now. If not, you're going to be hauled off to a jail. It's going to be discovered when you get to the jail, and you're going to get a second charge for taking drugs into another institution. She gives it to him. By then, my mother's are, my my son's mother's done made it way, her way through the line and has got on the little bus. They use a bus to actually take the inmates around and drop them off at sections of the prison. That's how big this prison is. And she's made her way into the part of the compound where I'm at. The only thing separates us now is two doors. They radio for the girls and told them everything. They've got a positive ID on who the second person is, that she's carrying narcotics. Go get her. I see them get her out the bathroom. I see my little boy walk out and my heart sinks. It's sinking, A, because I'm caught. B, because my little boy is caught up in the middle of some stupid shit I got going on in prison. Once again, here I am messing his life up, man. I have not learned my lesson yet. They take her away. They come straight in, get me and him, take us, lead us out, put us in handcuffs, and they take me to the investigator's office. I'm sitting there, talk to the investigators. State police comes in. The state police, the real police, police that ain't got nothing to do with the prison. This is the state police. They lay out the, the sacks they got that they recovered from the first girl on the table. Ask me what I think it is. I don't know what it is. What do you think it is? Shit, looks like crack to me. Ain't mine. Y'all ain't, ain't catch me with that. We got this off one of your visitors. That's a lie. That's a lie. You know what? I ain't got nothing to say, man. I don't know what you're talking about, lawyer. So I lawyer up. While in the hole, they bring me out and they do another, what they call, I guess, kind of interrogation. They start questioning me. But when I come in, they tell me, you ain't got to say nothing. Just sit here, shut up and be quiet. So I'm sitting there, I'm in my jumper, I'm at the table just listening to what they got to say and I'm just looking at them because I'm not going to say anything, I know better. And they start playing the phone recordings. It's my cellmate. It's the girl Tasha. He's talking. As I'm listening, I try not to show no emotion, show no fear, but in my head I'm thinking, I'm screwed. He's saying my name, saying my son's mother's name. He's saying exact dates this Saturday, how much he's going to be getting, how to do it. And there's several phone conversations. I think it was like six or seven different conversations he had had with her from the span of that past Saturday to that Saturday on what was going on. I was ultimately found guilty, conspiracy to commit, had more time added to my sentence. My son's mother was found guilty. The first girl that was caught, Tasha, told on everybody, didn't receive any time. Got out of jail the same day. And then I ran into another dude years down the road that was in jail behind, well, he was in prison behind the same exact girl that my cellmate was messing with. They got pulled over in a traffic stop. Something happened. They got her and the guy out the car, and she went on to tell the police officers that he had a gun and large amounts of drugs in the car. And that guy was sent off to prison as well. Crazy when I got to talking to that dude and he had mentioned the girl's name, and I was like, she from Richmond? And he was like, yeah. And I was trying to describe her. And he was like, yeah, that's her, man. I said, shit, she told on me too. But in reality, my cellmate's conversation told everything. She didn't have to say anything because they already had us red-handed. My release date changed by over a year because of that instance. I should have been home a year earlier, but I wasn't. I ended up damn near maxing out my sentence all because... He wanted to get on the phone where well, there's a sign that says these calls are being recorded and monitored. After I told him, I've been doing this a very long time, man. There's no heat on me. I only deal with select people. Nothing's went wrong thus far. I've never spoke on that phone. Please don't. He went right on out there with the investigators, the prison, pretty much everybody listening. I started talking. It always ends bad. After watching today's video, I want you to understand something. You're going to get caught. You're already incarcerated, which means you've already been caught. Take that as a lesson. Do your time and get home to your family. Get your life back on track. Reflect on everything that you've done wrong in the years that you've been alive, the way you think, your patterns of movement, what you call survival. Reflect on all that. Reflect on 
How your family that loves you feels with you being gone. Your kids feel with you being gone. And me doing what I was doing, I justified it by saying, this is what I got to do. When in reality, later on in my bed, I started doing what I should do. I started going to school, going to college, getting different courses under my belt that I would use when I got out. None of the things I was doing early on were for anybody else. I was putting people at risk for my gain. And I justified it by saying, well, I'm sending money home at Christmas. I'm able to send money home for school clothes and school supplies. When well, nobody ever expected me to do any of that. I wanted to still be the man while locked up. You know, a man wants to be a man. I didn't want my son to have to suffer because I was gone. When I was on the streets, I made sure that anything and everything that was needed was taken care of. And that was all done through illegal activity. You would think once you get jammed up and you're sent off to prison, you learn from your mistakes. But for the majority of us, the guys that were actively, you know, involved in an everyday life of crime, we don't learn until many years on. That's why they gave me 10 years. They know sometimes, I'm not going to say always, because I don't agree with a lot of the sentencing I see. I think it's bullshit that drugs can get you 50 years, but killing somebody can get you 20. I don't agree with it always, but with my 10-year sentence, they knew what they were doing. Seven, eight years in, I was still a messed up individual. I was still trying to get over on the system, th still thought I was slick. In the last few years, I matured into the man that you see now. Don't take any of this as something you should ever do, me trying to glorify or justify. It's all stupid. Getting locked up is stupid. Committing crimes is stupid. How are you going to say you're going out and you're taking chances to support your family only to ultimately be snatched up and taken away from your family and leaving them to fend for themselves. Guys won't go get a job because it doesn't pay enough for them to support their family, but then will go to prison and work for 27 cent an hour just to have something to do. Do what you're supposed to do, not what you want to do. You don't have to worry about ever being caught up in none of these stories I talked about today. All 100% facts, all happened exactly the way I said it happened. And if you do want to be a criminal and you do decide to go to jail and get your dumb ass locked up, end up in prison, and you're just going to continue to do what you do, stay away from the phone. But my advice is do what you have to do to take care of your family out here. Do it the right way. I heard somebody say the most gangster thing you can do is take care of your family. Get up and go to work every single day. When you're tired, when you're sick, no matter what, you get up and you go out there so that them lights stay on, so that that food's in the refrigerator, so that, that that wife or that girl of yours is taking care of, them kids are taking care of. That's gangster. Not going out there and doing dumb stuff. Anybody can go do some dumb shit. But getting up every day, day after day after day, in the name of someone else, to make sure that someone else is taken care of, that's what being the man is. That's what being gangster is. Hope y'all enjoyed today's video. Some do's and don'ts. Some good stories on things I've seen, things I was caught up with. It is what it is, man. But anyways, these jails, institutions, detention centers, these prisons, they're all just crazier world outside of this already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. And to all my real ones. And the awesome real ones watching. Because y'all still watching me. Man, y'all know how we do. Salute.